Welcome to the final episode of season one of the Overtly Critical Film Show. I'm Ryan. And I'm Corwin. And this week we finished off with Metropolis from 1927, directed by Fritz Lang and starring Brigitte Helm and Gustav Frulich. I saw this movie. I'd heard a lot about this movie forever. And it's, I, it's a very iconic movie. It's hard not to yeah. hear about it. And uh, I finally got down to watching it last year, and I was pretty impressed by it. I, I'm not... I was kind of surprised. I don't always sit through silent films, and that was kind of me being stubborn, I think, or whatever. Um, but I sat through it, and I was like, that was entertaining. Uh, the, the score was nice in it, so I was like, okay, this is fine. This is a good experience, and I wasn't ever bored, and I was pretty impressed by it. And then when we came up with our lists, you had mentioned it, because of like some of the sci-fi stuff we had done, and I was like, "That'd be a good idea to do that." Yeah, I had never seen Metropolis, but I had uh, I tried to watch it a few times before, but never gone through it all the way. Um, just because silent movies can be a little daunting to watch if you're not accustomed to them. Um, but I was interested to see it, um, especially not just because it's you know one of those iconic movies, but it's very influential for science fiction which is you know my bread and butter i love that shit and you know there's a lot of direct um inspirations you can see from blade runner the visual style and the uh the themes of the story even um although not as much as i thought there would be in a futuristic city sharply divided between the working class and the city planners the son of the city's mastermind falls in love with a working-class prophet who predicts the coming of a savior to mediate their differences. The kind of, I don't know, not even moral of the story, but the whole, like, idea of the movie is the mediator between the head and hands must be the heart. It feels very old school, but, you know, it works. It's, this is the point of the movie. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, this is going to be the takeaway. Fredder mm-hmm. is kind of this very, like, elite class person. We see them, like on a big track the working class lives deep underground uh there's this great shot where they climb this massive elevator that like its gates shut like a prison door and they're marching like they're literally machines it's like shift change to they're marching to the um uh, to the machines they work for 10 hour days there's this one guy who's literally like his whole job is like move things that look like Mm. a clock who knows um and then it cuts to the beautiful i think they call it um Oh, what's it? The Garden of the Suns? The Club of Suns is kind of like what they call like the elite kind of group of people. Mm-hmm. But now nah, it's some garden. It's like obviously satire. It's very, very um, literal. Like the workers are literally like clockwork. They are machines, yeah. In, what, something I wrote down when we were watching this is uh, men are machines and machines are men. Or machines are demons. There's that great um, scene which was actually pretty early on. And, I, you know, a lot of people have seen the, she- the scene where like the big machine i think it's called the heart machine or something turns into like a monster and men are like being fed into its mouth that's a, that's a kind of hallucination um, by fredder it, it's it's this um i i for a second i thought is this literal or like what's is this a vision and they show like as they fade between it that this is something he's picturing but yeah. it really does set up the way people are treated in this world it's you know kind of common that you know a guy meets a girl from a different class, but also that he switches lives with Fredder switches lives with a worker. My God! So once Fredder sees all these kids, he's like, oh, "All these working class people, like he he probably doesn't even recognize that they exist." And you get that feeling that he doesn't oh, even yeah. like he doesn't even know that like these are people that live like like maybe he knows that they're there, but he hasn't seen. There's them. a great moment early on where he's got all these women competing for Fredder's attention because you know he's the son of the basically the autocrat of this world the maria the the prophet lady comes in and she's got all these children it's like these are your brothers and sisters and he's got this look in his eye like this is the first time he's ever seen these people yes because he's lived it you pick up on the fact that he's lived his life completely away from this world and then he not only is he like driven by his uh, his heart's desire for maria um but he's driven by the curiosity of who are these people and he he really starts to see the nuts and the bolts that make the gorgeous city that he lives off of and he just he can't have it mm-hmm. and then he confronts his father and his father's like uh his father kind of just brushes him off doesn't really care um and then that he, leads he, him to yeah he does grow suspicious of him though he's like you know he tells like yeah he tells the thin man who's yeah. a character who got absolutely gutted in the version oh we my god yeah uh, for context backpelling here uh, the version we watched was not the complete version that is you can find now. Yeah, so like the Thin Man is like one of uh, Joe Fredersen's like 
I don't know what you call them, assistants, like kind of like hitmen, you know, One Bo- of goons. Boba Fett kind of like, go do this for me. Yeah, no um, disintegrations. Th- and there's actually a really funny, speaking of Blade Runner, there is a shot of him in the movie that we didn't see in our version where he's reading the newspaper. And it's like exactly like uh, that scene in Blade Runner. It's mm. almost exactly the same. I would have loved to see um, that actually. Because it's when he follows the worker, was well, it like 11811, something like that, that Fredder trades lives with. Um, and so that guy that he trades lives with, he like gets in and he gets someone's like throwing invitations he gets in a taxi and he sees and this wasn't in our version he gets like an invitation to go to some like elite club and it's like you know like the sleazy red light district i think was yeah. the impression i got from the uh the the text crawl that they did yeah it's like um yeah and a couple times in the movie when they show like the club scene it's very I would even call it psychedelic. Now, is that the same club that later on, after the Machine Man turns into, um, is made to look like Maria, that she's like do, being an erotic dancer at? Is that the same club? We can assume so. I think it's important to touch on a really big part of the movie that um, really accentuates some of the uh, genre of the film, and that's Rotwang. <laughs> it's kind of this trope of like, uh, you know, the exiled guy that lives in the woods, kind of away from everybody, kind of thing. Um, in this big grand city, he has this like uh, I loved that. Th- it's like this yeah. gothic looking house, and it's and like, it's like in a factory too. I think the city is on stilts. I think that's oh. the way they explain it away, at least in the movie. It could be in a factory, but when mm. there's a scene where Fredder is walking outside, where it seems there are people walking around in the city, and everything is on these like metal uh, stilts, so we can maybe assume that, but it could be in a factory. Who knows? But it's hidden. Rotwang does feel like this relic from a previous right. time. You know, we can look at Blade Runner, and we kind of said it's like a sci-fi noir. Mm-hmm. This is like sci-fi gothic expressionism, because yeah, there's a lot of yeah. like very. Uh, and Rotwang kind of is that he, like, uh, he dresses almost. He's like, he's like a Doctor Frankenstein yes, character. Just like the interior design of where he lives is very like futuristic but also yeah like, you, uh, compared to the cleanness of the rest of the world route wang's house is kind of dirty it's got like cluttered mm-hmm. um machines and shit going on there's like tesla tube light things yeah everywhere. the tesla coils there's another point about this movie that i think is interesting as futuristic as it is it's very biblical this tower of babel story of like building this um this great monument to um these great thinkers in the world and they get all like these just workers to do it but the workers just they don't really give a shit about what the workers are doing so the workers destroy it um that actually brings me into it's not just about like you know the workers and the rich people in this class divide and the struggle for you know understanding but it's also about obsession with like the past and someone's legacy um because just Joe Friederson, he has this in Rot in Rotwang's house. He and Rotwang are both obsessed with his dead wife, Hell, um, which apparently was why it was censored in the United States, which is stupid. Yeah, but they're obsessed with his um with his wife. So they have this monument to her, and they're trying well, to build her out of the ma- build the Machine Man into her. Um, but also the Tower of Babel story. These rich people, not the rich people, but these great thinkers um, and scholars want to build this monument to their greatness. Um, but they're doing it on the backs of other people, and the city is almost a monument to Frieder. They actually, that tower in the movie is called the New Tower of Babel. Exactly. And they don't, I'm pretty sure they don't actually call the city anything in the movie, but it's referred to as New Babylon. Really? In a lot of extended text. Hey, look at this. We can build the, this monument too, but we did it because, you know, we have good relationship between the head and hands, but it could collapse if we don't. And the, later exactly um and also um, a thing about hell i found out i had to read this because it's not exactly clear in the movie hell was with rotwang left him for frederson oh because i you know i picked up on there was something going on between rotwang yes. and and uh, frederson and uh hell but i didn't yeah. pick up on that's that. why rotwang in the end of the movie changes makes the robot uh kind of destroy the city so that that mm-hmm. ruins Fredder. It ruins Frederson, and then he tries to take Maria, which ruins Fredder, because it's mm-hmm. like the child that he doesn't like that exists. Oh, another great detail with Rotwang is his hand, which yeah. first off looks like a piece of shit, but that was the time. It's a rubber glove or something. That's what Star Wars uh, um, does. True. In his quest to like make a machine man, he's becoming a machine himself, and I just really liked that little detail. 
Um, and that ties into how basically through his abuse of the working class, Jill Friederson is basically turning men into machines. His own son, um, when he swaps places with the worker, is like, Jesus Christ, Father, when will these, um, uh, when is it Jesus Christ, but when will, when will 10 hours end, like calling out to his father and like his mind? I, I will say this, a parallel between this and Blade Runner is the idea of like what makes human human and machine mm-hmm. machine. Because like, I mean, as, as thinking about that, like, um, it's almost like the robot. Um, it, it's it's so weird to, if you want to call the robot hell or not in the movie, because it's like Maria, but it's not Maria. It's Machine Man, yeah. but the Machine Man that looks like Maria is could al- is almost more human like than the workers, and yeah. that's a interesting. Thing. I, I gotta give it to um Helm Bridget Helm Bridget Br- Helm Bridget Helm, um the actress who played Maria and the uh, the Machine Man Maria what a standout performance to me you know it's very much in that exaggerated like old style of acting where everything's like ah woo, ah but like she goes from playing this very like you know almost matronly character with uh the real maria to like almost a sex object in um the machine man and it's just it's just great and she you can tell she's having a lot of fun with that role and uh it just really stood out to me i like that <laughs> a lot yeah with the great eyes the look she does mm. There's so, there's actually some like Marxist people that don't like the movie I can because see that. the only reason why the workers actually revolted is because they were tricked. But they they were tricked kind of. Not really I don't want to say tricked, but they were uh you know, they were it's seen as a negative thing that they rise up where yeah, they it almost does, kill their there kids. There are negative consequences to that. I think that that's the way of the of the movie almost saying like see what happens when you try to stand up for yourself. And it's it, to me, I was like, I don't know if I like that. I don't know if that's an unfair read of it, but to me, uh, they do almost directly say um, that basically Friederson is trying to incite violence with Maria, the the machine man of Maria, um, to make them well, right, actually, fight that's against true. each other. And you know, you could get down a whole like left wing political rabbit hole about oh, that. You know what? I kind of just realized what so. Frederson wanted to make use the robot Rotwing to make Maria make the workers mm. kind of like so discord within them, but Rotwing changed her motivation so that it would ruin the factory, so that ruins Frederson. He exactly he wants he he's the one who like orders the machine, um, the heart machine destroyed, and you'll notice that it really doesn't affect the upper people; it only floods the lower levels. He's trying to destroy the it doesn't really make a lot of sense because you know why are you trying to destroy the people who run your city but then then but they then still. they destroy what i think it's like and the m machine or something something else gets destroyed because the, right. the city lights go out that's right right frederson realizes that when people don't work together then his city doesn't work so he's like well i kind of want my city lights back I want my pretty view out well, my so window. So one thing, basically nothing fucking changes at the end of the movie. Yeah. We really don't get to see, like, what the new society they build is, and that's a shame. Yeah, I mean, because, like, you'd think, like, okay, is he going to is he gonna start paying the workers better? Exactly. Is he going to help their living? Is he going to let they them live hands. in the city? You know, like, yeah. So Thea von Harbo, um, Harbo, Bow, whatever her name is, uh, Fritz Lang's wife at the time, she wrote it. She wrote the book first um, and then wrote yep. the adaptation. So she ended up becoming a Nazi filmmaker. And Whereas Fritz Lang fled to America. Because, I, I read a yeah. little bit. I read a really great article that talked about how the movie like actually is not fascist at all. And one of the better points it made is that like just the society that's organized is not the same. And I think one of the interesting points is that they, they mention technology where it's like, whereas like a, like a fascist regime would use technology to build military and to build weapons and to build like, you know, like fucking concentration camps to divide people this one instead is more like look at, like they're they they're proud of the technology mm-hmm. that they have they just happen to subjugate their workers to yeah, worse it, conditions it's it's and there's not a lot of race in it's the not movie. really it's like, not like a critique on fascism or a critique on really a single political ideology um the most you could say is it's very anti like capitalist i wish we got to see more of frederson's change because i mm-hmm. i think he it feels I think, like it comes out of nowhere. Yeah, I think his character changes too. I mean, the city falls falls apart around him very fast, but I feel like at the ending, he's kind of just like, you know, all right, I'm changed. And his hair turns gray. You know, I somewhat agree with the message of this movie about, like, the, the idea of this mediation because, you know, th- this idea that there are people who have great grand ideas and kind of rise up as leaders, 
but you know if you're not doing the work maybe you should treat the people who are doing the work well there's and basically the idea of you know prioritizing um humanity more than just achievement well there's value in both the head and the hands it's you know that's i, I think the movie it doesn't make a bad point about that i just think that the ending left more to be desired for me personally i agree this is not the first thing I thought of, but the f- most important thing I think about this movie's visual style, other than the fact that it's kind of a leftover from German Expressionism, is I think that this is a product of its time because of the Art Deco look of the movie. The architecture and art styles of like post-World War I, um, which includes like a lot of, I think like the Chrysler building and stuff like that. Um, this movie definitely is that, and Fritz Lang based the look of it off of the New York skyline. And I think it, like, takes that kind of style of, like, early 20th century architecture and, like, kind of, like, puts it to its logical conclusion, I think. Um, Because this movie came off as, like, I would maybe call it diesel punk. Maybe it helped inspire the genre, but when I think of diesel punk, I think, like, back a decade, I'm thinking, like, World War I itself to World War II. But I can see what you mean. Yeah, just in, like... um a lot of, like the industrialization of everything but it's you know it's like I like the old cars it, we kind of talked about like the whole retro futurism thing and in, in the Blade Runner thing I, I love like predictions of the future that are like some ways are so wrong but other ways are so right like they thought there would be biplanes flying around the city it's just like such a oh that's such a 1920s thing it's just interesting I love um, the matte paintings in this movie yes. that just paint these gorgeous skylines. Um, I only think there's like 10 shots of the city, of Metropolis. There's but you don't forget them. them. It's very minimal style overall, too. Very minimalist. Like, you don't see a lot of, like, even in the workers' area, you don't see a lot of, like, trash everywhere. It's very clean. It's a very clean it is. city. It's a lot more dull, and that's actually something I'd, I'd get to. It's a lot more, um, like, you feel like in the city, in, actually, in actual metropolis, if we're going to call it that, it's um, the city feels alive. And that's why I feel like they can sit on those shots of the city for 10 seconds and get a really, really wide angle because there's so much going on. Whereas when you get down to the worker city, it's, like, dead. Not a, I mean, not just brighter. There's a sky in the... Uh, in the overworld, we'll call it, of the actual city, whereas in the workers' you know town, it's like they have a ceiling, like they don't yeah, even imagine, have sunlight. Just imagine for a minute that you live in a world without a sky. Mm-hmm. They might have like that sun windows, but that would fuck with me. We all, I mean, again, this is also visual, but again, very, very literal depiction of workers. You know, like move the clock thing, and boom, everyone. It, it's almost like you look at what they're doing, and you think, what the hell is this even? What does it matter? It's like, what is this actually doing? It doesn't look like it has any purpose. That's satire for you. It's almost a uh, surreal movie as well, some parts. Um, Like, you get this great shot in the nightclub where um, the machine man is dancing, and you get, like, the the collage of eyes, but also, like, the the big machine monster, the heart machine, where it's, like, people are feeding into its mouth uh mr bones with the the representation of death old movies they like to uh, iris effect or vignette some of their shots for, for the most part didn't care about rule of thirds yeah either. dramatic and focus but i will say this there was one shot that because i know the time period it looked so modern for some reason so usually in these movies they still kind of treated them almost like stage plays so like if me and you were having dialogue it would be like this. I'd be facing, mm-hmm. like I'm presenting you it cheat to the out. camera. You, you, yeah, you cheat out to the audience. Yeah. Joseph Fat, the guy who, who he fires, is is talking to him. And there's an over-the-shoulder rule of thirds shot. And I was like, whoa. Mm-hmm. That's like, I don't think I've ever seen a movie that old do that. They do a POV shot, a they, moving POV shot in this movie. When he's um, reaching for like the um, the torn garment from Maria when he's in uh, um, Stinky Dick's house. Right wing. And he's reaching for it. And I was like, whoa! Yeah, it was a POV a, shot. It was a weird camera move. It's like, it they like, don't do that. They didn't do that a lot back then. That's cool. Um, you know, one of my favorite shots in this movie, though, and it's like a bit of visual effects work, very early work, is the elevator in the beginning going down. Because we see, you know, the city move. And I'm wondering, was that a matte painting? Was that a projection? How did they do that? And it looks great. There was a shot of like crowds of people coming together, and then they they did like a composite thing of a close up. So it kind of it gave it a sense of scale. So it looked like they were all walking up. I liked that. I loved. You the, noticed um, that? Yeah, I loved the okay. the filmmaking in the uh, Tower of Babel sequence. One of my favorite tricks they do is you talked about vignette. How a lot of these shots are vignetted. Um, something I noticed is the first time we see Maria, she has like 
and just in the uh, the Garden of the Suns or whatever in general, it is this very like almost glowing vignette to it. It's it's surrounded by white. Where we first see Joe Frederson, he's got a very heavy dark vignette, heavier than normal. And it's a great bit mm-hmm. of contrast. Yeah, I think Marie is definitely painted to look like an angel. Blonde, white, white mm-hmm. dress. Very just like boo bright. I, I really love Rotwang in this movie just because it's such a, again, it's like a combination of like futurism, but also this like really like gothic. He's almost horror. he's almost dressed like a, uh, what's the word, like a warlock kind of. He feels like, like a gothic horror character. He does. To me. Literally like the climax of this movie where uh, Stinky Dick is fighting um, uh, Fredder. Fredder is on a cathedral. Yeah, there's like gargoyles like and, and he shit. Falls through it. Yeah. It's like some fucking uh, hunts back from Notre Dame shit. Obviously, lots of makeup in the movie, and that's also expressionist too. They love to make up the shit out of people's eyebrows and. I I love you know. that shit where like Frieder when he's a worker, he's got like the basically the eyeliner. It doesn't. It's not realistic, but it, it it's it's cool and the lighting as well. This is like we talked about motivated lighting in the last episode. Um, None, basically none of this movie is motivated lighting. They light it like a stage. They light it to see what you need to see and to see the entire set. Right. And a lot of that is just, you know, that was the style at the time because people were still trying to figure out filmmaking. But there are elements that are motivated. Like we see the flickering of the fire on some people's faces. Yeah, the bonfire um, when they burn the In the flashlights thing. chase where uh, Ratwang is chasing um, uh, Maria through the, uh, the catacombs. Uh, she's spotlit. I really like the shot where uh, Rotwing is chasing Maria, and he finally catches her, and he has a light on her, and it's just a shot of the light, him, and there's two skulls behind him. Yes. Did you see that? Yes, that was I pretty, liked that a lot. That was really cool. The, definitely the look of the characters we talked about. Um, just the contrast between uh, Frederson and how he looks. He is just, all these rich guys, they have, like, the clean haircuts, and they have the, the nice suits, and then you see the workers that are in these, like, black gray Looks brown like a prison uniform scrub, like a prison jumpsuit. scrubs kind of jumpsuits and they have like grot that one worker has like a big beard and he's like scraggly and it's it's just it's just very simple way to differentiate them what do you think the the upside down pentagram star thingy symbolized because it's in a couple places in rot Lang's home especially the big one behind where he builds the machine man uh, see to me you've got um if you got a if, if you got five point star that comes from you know paganism and like right. Wicca, um, if it's pointing up it's generally pagan. If it's pointing down it's generally Satan. And you get both in Rotwang's house. He's got the catacombs beneath his house. Um, it could be like he's this you know he said warlock this like devil worshipper. He's like the the dark arts. I don't think it was like something super like super powerful to it mm. except that you could contrast that with the christian imagery in maria like how she has the tons of crosses behind her like altar and you get the cathedrals um well they, they do end up calling the machine person a witch and they try to burn her though. yeah there are some you're, there are some religious uh statements in this another you know evidence to support it's not like a communist movie that would never fly in a communist movie no. It's a mix of styles it's this kind of like taking the modern style of new york at the time and pushing it to a futuristic look, mixing it with, like, expressionist, you know, gothic things. And um, I think it's a cool mix that way. The characters are dressed different. Um, it's damned iconic. You're not going to forget that style. So for the audio section, this is a silent movie. So, yeah, there's that. Uh. <laughs> I will say this. I think you don't truly appreciate how good a score is until you watch a silent film. Because mm-hmm. I feel like nowadays <laughs> composers are just lazier because they, they have less responsibility. I don't know if lazy is the right word. It's just generally nowadays you often have more of a style of a minimalist score where like scores are more like just tones or like like chords and stuff and you don't have like a really strong theme to a movie like you have with um well metropolis or like star wars indiana jones a lot of those classic blockbusters that defined um the later half of the 20th century obviously silent films are they're just much better at it. they're much better at, you know sinking the sound to the film and I'm, I'm sure we watched a rescored version what they would do in a lot of silent movies is they would just have a guy who would sit at a theater organ and improv live basically in the scenes in the factory or the, the with the machine they have like these like you know almost like chugging themes like the machines themselves 
That's that's always people a fun are doing one. stuff in time to the music, right? Um, and the the shots of Metropolis and the version we watch are accompanied by this like really grand music. It's it's uh it's like one of the more like hopeful points of the movie where it's like look at how beautiful the city is and it's like you know it's mm-hmm. it's like uh, I don't know what like when uh, Frieder is tr- like trying to appeal to his father by saying look at the the work you've done, but it was built on the backs of people. You got to like treat them better. It's like there's a theme that accompanied Frederson that was very dark. I did notice that, and I liked that a lot. All right, so now it is time for Film Facts with Super 8. He's, he's back this week. Got, his, got his, 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 uh, his swag tripod back. He wanted to be put on a pedestal, so we, it did. we let him have you, it. You and, idol. Uh, so give us some facts about this near 100-year-old movie. <laughs> The multiple exposed sequences were not created in a lab, but right during the filming on the set. The film was rewound in the camera and then exposed again right away. This was done up to 30 times. Film included more than 37,000 extras, including 25,000 men, 11,000 women, 1,100 bald men, 750 children, 100 dark-skinned people, and 25 Asians. 310 shooting days were required. No optical printing system existed at the time, so to create a matte effect, a large mirror was placed at an angle to reflect a piece of artwork while live footage was projected onto the reverse. To expose the projected footage, the silvering on the back of the mirror had to be scraped off in strategically appropriate places. One mistake would ruin the whole mirror. Fritz Lang said that he enjoyed making the film, but didn't like it much after it was done. Being one of the most expensive movies of the time, costing around 5 million marks, this film nearly sent the UFA, or the Universum Film, into bankruptcy. The film takes place in 2026. The flooding underground scene took three weeks to shoot, as Fritz Lang wanted to get the scene just right. This had a huge impact on the health of the actors, as he also kept the water at a constant low temperature. Reportedly one of Adolf Hitler's favorite films. Thanks for those wonderful facts, Super 8. Um, I feel very smart now to know that we like a movie that Adolf Hitler likes. Um, Thank you for the elucidation. (laughs) Um, So, our favorite moment of the movie. My favorite moment of this movie, and I knew it when I saw it, um, it it almost was the Tower of Babel scene, but for me, it's that first scene where we meet Frederson. I love the gorgeous matte painting shots because it's like one of the first times we get these these gorgeous views of the um uh, the city but i also love the music you talked about it where it's this wicked dark tone and that's also we see that heavy vignette on um frederson compared to maria um and it sets up this conflict of the movie um and we get all these moments where he's like why am i learning about this from the, him and not from grata not you as he fires uh what the joseph, fat. joseph fat. It just stuck with me it's good acting you know shit typical scene i think it was cool when they woke up the machine man and made it into maria just because it's a combination of, of so i can look at that scene and i can find like 20 movies and i'm like oh that came right from this i mean a, like human like ai that's like terminator blade runner that's probably um, the second most iconic scene in the movie, aside from right. the Machine Man it's, scene. You know, it's like very, people. it's very future. Again, it's like a blend of all these things. It's like definitely like a horror kind of thing because it's like creating a, a beast, a monster, or something. But it's also a robot. There's like, uh, it's also like kind of chemistry scientific because there's like all these like uh, beakers of liquids. We don't know what the fuck it is. Fritz Lang didn't either. He's just making stuff up. Um, it just looks cool. It's just very, it's, it's, it's sci-fi. The hesitation we see in Rotwang's eyes before he pulls the lever. It's just a really subtle moment. They don't like cut in on it. They don't make it a big thing, but you can see it where he's really like, should I be doing this? It's maybe him like feeling some regret last minute. You know, uh, part of it is he's consumed by the obsession of Frederson, but also a lot of it is his own obsession. Right. Also, the effects in that scene are just good. Like the, the ring effect around the... I still don't even know how they did a lot of those old effects. I know there's a lot of drawing on on film, yeah. but uh, I just really like that scene. Um, it looks good. Yeah. It, you know, when it looks better than a lot of shitty CGI looks, <laughs> it really is like just a testament to uh, the power of um, of old magic. So the lesson we learned from this movie, I can go first with this, I guess. 
I'm going to say mise-en-scene in general. In a silent film, it's very important that you can tell a visual story when you have no sound, you have no dialogue, other than a couple of title cards. But um, which is another thing I want to say. I think that's really cool about silent movies, by the way, that because you have to wait a second to see what people actually say, sometimes a little bit of an anticipation. I think that's kind of cool. Um, but I think just comparing the designs of the worker city and the city itself, and especially like we said with Rot Wings room, what he, how he's dressed, how Frederson's dressed, how Frederson's room looks, this very modern furniture, these very uh, like pretty elaborate shapes, whereas down in the and where the workers live under in the depths, it's very like very minimal, very simplistic, um, and I like I think that those images they tell a story that they don't even need the dialogue for. And I think that movie kills it. I mean, you can you can tell when you're in the city and when you're not without even looking outside. You just need to look at what people are dressed as, and it's it just works really well. My lesson is kind of a cop out because the fact that Metropolis is a silent movie, it allows it to really demonstrate the power of film as a visual narrative, uh, not visual narrative, but to to display a visual narrative. The power of film as a visual medium um, that you know not only just not really using sound for the most part, the music is very secondary, but I was surprised by how little dialogue there was. And like, there's a lot of scenes where like they'll show people talking and then not tell us what they said because it's less important what they said. It's more important that they, that they, the, 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 the tone of the argument is more important that they are arguing or that they are, that they're having a conversation, having conversation or that they're happy. And there are some shortcomings you can see. I definitely think that, you know, we don't need to go back to silent movies or we don't need to go back to movies with, like, no dialogue. But, you know, see the guys who who, who made the rules. That is our uh, thoughts on Metropolis. And uh, and that's our last movie for season one that is, of the Overtly Critical Film Show. Before we wrap things up, we're going to uh, throw it over to Joey, who's back to speak for... Uh, final episode of Funny Notes, and um, it's going to be a little special. Take it away, Joey. Hi, before we start today's episode, I want to address some controversy uh, coming on uh, the these past episodes. Uh, last episode, Super 8 did not write Funny Notes. I did. You, you want to see this? You want to see this little mother right here? This little cunt cock bag? You don't write fu- Funny Notes. Asshole. Hello and welcome to Funny Notes. The title for this is City Town People, Sweet Home, Alabama. What? The Thin Man. Child Slaves. Reverse Credits. I like that one. Willy Wonga Origins, midgets excluded. (laughs) The Aztec are dead. Daddy rejected me. End it. Wife is actually Satan. Symbol. Church is illegal. No! Mediator can't be a man. Corwin. Doors preventing plot. <laughs> right. Machines can't die. I love iPhone. That is the conclusion of season one of Funny Notes. Oh, it was such a great ride.